are any butt injectors. So let's start with the uh, problem here. So I have a uh, battery. Uh, let's say that that battery is a 12 volt battery. I have it connected to a switch. And on one branch I have a, uh, oh, let's keep things simple, a two ohm resistor. A four milli Henry inductor. On the other branch, I have a three microfarad capacitor. And a three ohm resistor. So, immediately after the switch is closed, so what happens? What about the branch with the inductor? What happens there? No There's no current through this immediately after it's closed. What about the branch with the capacitor? <coughs> current freely flows through the branch with the capacitor. Okay? So immediately after the switch is closed, this branch is where the current is going to be. There's going to be no current here. Okay? So for the first instance, so immediately, so for the two ohm resistor, we have zero, and for the three ohm resistor, we have what? Four amps. Okay, and then if we look at long time after, a long time after, what happens? There's none on the capacitor. There's side. none on the capacitor side because capacitor. the capacitor is charged, and then there will be some here. How much is going to be here? Six. Six. Six what? <laughs> Uh, amps. Amps. Six amps. Okay. So through the two ohm resistor, there would be six amps, and through the three ohm resistor, there would be zero. That's kind of a brief review of kind of the things we've been talking about with the inductor and how it works in the circuit. Um, actually, this actually is really two uh, different circuits. It's two separate circuits here. Because they're both when they're both connected to this 12 uh, volt battery. All right, so so just as a review, so we have a resistor. We have resistor R. Okay, the voltage across that resistor is what? IR and the energy we talk about with the resistor we're talking about what the power dissipated in the resistor that's what resistors do they dissipate power they convert it from electrical energy they convert energy from electrical to other forms heat light mechanical energy okay Okay, then our other old friend, capacitor. Voltage across the capacitor is what? Q over C. Q over C. And the energy stored in a capacitor is one half, and I'm gonna, we're gonna do it this way, Q squared over C. Our 
new one, the inductor, voltage across an inductor, this is the new one, it's L times DIDT. The energy stored in an inductor is one half L that's kind of our that's our kind of summary up to this point. All right. There were, sorry. Go ahead. In that last example that we just did, mm -hmm. instead of the capacitor, there was also another um, inductor. We haven't gotten there yet. Okay. You mean if there was an inductor instead of the capacitor over here? Yeah. Or even an additional. Okay. If, if there's an inductor instead of a capacitor over here, then these both block current at first, both allow current after. Okay. All right. And we've had circuits with resistors in them. Circuits with capacitors in series and parallel. We don't really do inductors in series and parallel, though we could. I just, we just don't really do it. Uh, since it depends on DIDT, and the voltage would, here would be the same, these would act the same as resistors do. If I put inductors in series, their inductance would add. If I put them in parallel, it would be a one over relationship because they're going because of the way that this is defined. But we don't really do it. Just, uh, and so, so we've had circuits with this, circuits with this, circuits with this. We've had RC circuits, okay? We've had LR circuits. What do we gotta do now? The CL circuit or the LC circuit. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at what happens when we put an inductor along with the capacitor. Now when we do this, we have to assume that they are ideal. Okay, they're ideal, that there's no resistance at all. There's no resistance at all. And we're gonna take a look at the LC circuit. And we're gonna see what happens. Now for this circuit, we want to start out with a charged capacitor. We're going to start out with a capacitor that has charge on it. Some Q naught. And I'm going to make this plate positive and this plate would have negative what? Q naught. So if I looked at the two plates, that's what they would have. Positive Q naught, negative Q naught. Put my inductor, have my inductor here. And then I have a switch. So there's my capacitor. Starts out with some Q naught on it. When I put an inductor, close the switch at T equals zero, look what happens. All right. So I'm going to go to another paper, kind of draw some pictures for us. Is that J or K? Huh? J. What's an S? It's a switch, S. Oh. Okay, so the switch is closed. I've got positive charges here, and negative charges there. So what's gonna happen when the switch is closed? Close the switch. Those charges are going to start what? Moving to the other side, okay? So they start moving to the other side, they start discharging. They start discharging through here. Now, of course, it's going to fight the current, and so the current will have to slowly build up so that that charge can move from one side to the other. 
Okay? So we move the charges, move the charges. So the charges start moving until the capacitor is no longer charged, like so. So in other words, it keeps moving. The current is formed until the charges move over to the other side. Okay? Everybody see that? So first I had charge on that capacitor. They discharge through the inductor. Current builds up so that the charges move to the other side. All right, there, we're done, right? No. Because this doesn't dissipate the, just doesn't dissipate anything. It's not a resistor. I now have current in there. So I have no charge on the capacitor, but I've got current in my inductor. That inductor is then going to keep pushing the current. It's going to keep pushing it. So, okay, well, current is going to keep pushing. Okay, so the inductor pushes current until there's no more current in the inductor. Okay? So, in other words, it keeps pushing the current, pushes those positive charges up here, negative charges go over here, and now there's no more current. Am I done? No. No. Because now I have charge on my capacitor. Oh, okay, well the charge the capacitor is going to discharge. Okay? So this charge is going to flow to the other side. Okay, here we go. We get there so that there's no more charges. We get the current going. The charge is pushed to the other side like this. My current. So, so I get the current going. So that my charges then discharge off the capacitor. There we go. Oh, well now I've got current here. Well, yeah, because this current is going to go, these positive charges are going to flow this way. Remember, our current direction is the flow of positive charge. It's getting hot, right? Well, that, there's no resistance for it to get hot. Okay. Remember, these are completely ideal. All right. Completely ideal. No resistance at all. Uh, okay, current's foot. Well, now the current. The inductor is going to keep pushing the current. This time it's going to push the current this way. So the positive charge is going to flow over here, pulling the negative charges off of that plate. And then we get to uh, this situation here. So we get to this situation where we have, okay, so we have the, so then we have positive charges here and negative charges here. Oh, look at this. That looks familiar. Oh, that's what we started with. So what happens is it just keeps going back and forth. Just keeps going back and forth. Sort of. I mean, theoretically it would if there's no resistance. It would just keep going back and forth. In, in, well, not if we just have an LC circuit. But let's see what this thing looks like, okay? So we know what it's gonna do. We know it's gonna go back and forth. We know it's gonna go back and forth. Let's look at how. Let's look at how it goes back and forth, okay? In order to do that, we have to look at some equations. Back over here. So now what we're gonna do is we have this uh, Kirchhoff loop law that we gotta use. We have to use the Kirchhoff loop law. In this case, the, if we we have to keep the sign straight here. It's kind of difficult here. So the charge on the capacitor divided by, so I'm going to use little q here so I can describe my little charge on the capacitor here. Okay, divided by capacitance. Now because of the way that I would define current through this thing, it ends up I'd have to uh, have a plus sign here, L, D, I, D, T. And that has to equal what? Zero. zero, because I don't have anything in the I don't have anything in the circuit. It's zero. And oh, but now I'm really messed up, right? <coughs> because if I look at this thing, 
uh, I, I don't have any other equation here. Now for resistors and for, and for, remember the RC circuit, we were able to put the current in terms of the charge on the capacitor. We can do that here as well. Because the current, remember, by definition is what? Because I've got this charge on the capacitor and that current has to be associated with that charge because we've only got this one loop here. So this is equal to dq dt, where the q is the charge on the capacitor. <coughs> okay, because the charge that flows through the inductor goes on the capacitor. Okay, so if I put this in here, what happens? So I take DDT of DDT. It's, uh, what do we call it? Calculus people, they're, go ahead, you're saying it. The second derivative. Okay, so what this does is this makes this look like this. Okay, so Q over C plus L D square Q DT square equals zero. Take this to the other side, it becomes a negative. Divide by L, and we get this. We get d squared q dt squared is equal to minus 1 over LC times q. Now since this is you some of you may have run into this before. Okay? Well I know everybody's run into this at least once before. Hopefully. If you're if you're if you're one hundred if you're if you're a 220A teacher, I'm sure they would have gotten to this. You at least got it in the lab. What this thing looks like. Of course, it doesn't. You, you know, Q. I've never seen Q or whatever it is. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a look at a different formula that you would have had. What it looks like. Okay. Go back. U squared. Minus D T squared. Remember this equation? Maybe not in that form. Okay. Let me remind you where this equation comes from. Let me write this. Let me go backwards in the derivation. You tell me when you start recognizing it, okay? I'm going to multiply both sides by m. It's a spring. There you go. Recognize the spring formula. See? Kind of have to go backwards for this. By the end of this class, please recognize this equation. Anything in that form. Second derivative of something equals negative some constant multiplied by that same something. That's an oscillator. Simple harmonic. That's a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay? It's just like the spring system just like the pendulum at small angles. So in other words, this Q, the solution to this is going to be sines and cosines. Sines and cosines, just like the simple harmonic oscillator. Okay? So now we can uh, calculate uh, different things by relating it back to this equation here. So 
let's go ahead and I'll, I'll keep this blue so for the spring. So I'm going to write down the other spring equation. Okay. So if you remember the spring formula, so x is equal to the amplitude multiplied by cosine of omega t. And this is for a specific situation. When you start at a pulled maximum amplitude and release it. <coughs> Just pull it and release. That's and release it at t equals zero. Uh, theoretically, there would be some phase angle in here because you could actually start the clock anywhere you want. But we do like to keep things a little simpler you know, before we, we go through this. Uh, those of you who are differential equations, how many of you are in the differential equations class? Okay. You would uh, have a combination. You would write this down as a combination of sine and cosine with A sine omega t, cosine uh, B cosine omega t, and then use your what to figure out what A and B are? Initial conditions. That's what you would use to figure that out. You guys need it anyway. Anybody in here is going to have to take this class eventually. So even though you don't have to know this now, see, there's a little wrong. It tells me to do a differential equation for you all. Okay? Show you how this thing works. All right? So the way that we're going to work this is we have this equation right here. So we have d squared cubed, dt squared is equal to minus 1 over lc times q. Now this is actually kind of simple in terms of its initial conditions that we know. So we say, okay, Q as a function of time is going to be equal to some constant A times sine of omega t plus B cosine omega t. Where omega, by the way, is given by, is specific and it's already, it's already specified. Over here, we would have the omega, which is, by the way, is the angular frequency of this. Angular frequency is the square root of k over m. Square root of k over m. This, by the way, gives you the period, which is equal to 2 pi divided by omega. So in other words, the period of the oscillation, the spring is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m over k. Now, if this were 100b instead of the 220b, I wouldn't expect you to make this next leap. But since it is 220, I do expect you to make this leap. Because all you have to do is take this equation here and say this is exactly the same form as this equation. It's just got different letters in it. This two derivatives of a function equals some negative constant times that function. So. For this equation, the omega was the square root of k over m. What's the omega for this equation? Almost 1 over lc, but the what of 1 over lc? The square root of 1 over lc. Okay? The square root of 1 over lc. So the omega here is forced. No matter where you start this, it's going to be forced by your inductor and your capacitor. And it should be. So the omega here is equal to, and we simplify it a little bit because it's uh, the square root of 1 over LC. Well, just the square root of 1 is 1. So this is just 1 over the square root of LC. And then if we wanted to do the period of this, even though we never really do, we never do, but if we want to talk about the period of this, it would be 2 pi multiplied by 1 over this, and 1 over that just brings the square root to the numerator here. So it would be the square root of LC. 
Now, the reason why we never really talk about the period of an LC circuit is because L is in the order of milli Henry's, and C, we're talking about microfarads or nanofarads, and so your period here would be on the order of 10 to the negative three seconds. It's not something you could like measure in a lab, so you don't really worry about. Now, what we do talk about in an, uh, for an LC circuit isn't the period. It's the frequency. <clears throat> because the frequency is something that we use. It is something that we have. And these frequencies are going to be reasonable frequencies. They're going to be like 1,000 hertz, you know, 100 hertz, 1,000 hertz, megahertz, different kinds of frequencies here. Because these numbers are very small. So one over this number is going to be very large. So the frequency here is equal to 1 over 2 pi. One over square root of LC. And that's your frequency of those oscillations. And that's in hertz. So that omega inside of this is dictated. And by the way, if you for you know you get stumped, what you do is you take two derivatives of this. Put it back in here, and the omega will drop out. The omega, you'll see the omega come out, and you'll get that the uh, omega is equal to one over squared plus. And by the way, it is important for this negative sign to be there, because if not, then you'd have imaginary omega, which, if this were positive, it'd be some exponential function, but not the uh, sines and cosines. You'd have an exponential. Okay. So now to our initial conditions to see which one of these is. Uh, Okay. So the initial condition that we have in our circuit is that at t equals zero, q is equal to q naught, and the current is equal to what? Zero. Because when you first do the switch, you know this is zero. The inductor is going to block it. We have zero. So then we simply use this first condition and say, okay, Q naught is equal to A sine of zero. What's sine of zero? Zero. So that's zero. Uh, what's cosine of zero? So it's zero plus B. Oh, this tells us right away that B is equal to Q naught. So I know that B is equal to Q naught. How do I get I out of this thing? I have to take a derivative of it. So if I take a derivative of this, I get my current. So I equals dQ dt. So this is derivative of a sine is cosine. And then a factor of omega comes out. So I take the derivative of what's inside. So this is A omega cosine omega t. Hmm? No, it's not. No, no, no. Derivative of a cosine is negative, negative sine. So this the negative b factor of omega comes out, sine of omega t. Now we take this and evaluate it at t equals zero for our initial conditions. So dq dt evaluated at t equals zero. Cosine of zero is one, so a times omega, uh, sine of zero is zero. zero. Plus zero is equal to my initial current, and my initial current is what? Zero. zero. So I set this equal to the initial current, which is zero. Zero minus zero is zero. zero. Omega is not zero. So therefore, 0 divided by omega is 0. zero. And so therefore, a here is zero. 0. So a is equal to 0. See, no, that wasn't too hard, was it? OK, well. Okay. So anyway, if, you, if, you're, if you're in DPQ, yeah, I just did some good review for you. And you know, that's what you have to do with this thing. 
Um, if you're not there, you'll get there. You get there, that's what you do. All right, so bottom line is, is that the charge on the capacitor as a function of time It's Q naught, um, my Q naught is. Actually, I used capital Q naught in it when I said Just remember that Q naught is a constant number because that means Q at time equals zero. Multiply by cosine, my omega t. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so I've got a three point oh oh microfarad capacitor. Okay, initially charged to twelve volts. Okay. <coughs> it's hooked in series with a 4.5 millihenry inductor. And the switch is closed. <coughs> At t equals zero. I'm trying to make the S, that's an S. Well, that's because these were the two other options the J and the three. That's a J. My writing is, you know. <laughs> the one most people get that exception. My pies, yeah. Well, because I kind of switched this up here, so if you don't see where the marker is, you kind of like a slanted J. All right. So, uh, first of all, let's find out what the initial charge is. If my voltage is equal to 12 volts across the capacitor, so that's my initial, uh, how much uh, charge is on the capacitor? Okay, so we rearrange the formula for voltage. <coughs> Charge is voltage times the capacitance. <coughs> so my Q naught here, my initial charge is going to be what? 36. What? Microcoulomb. Microcoulomb. There we go. Don't forget that little factor of 10 to the negative 6 there. All right. Yeah, I gave you 12 volts. Okay, let's find the uh, the frequency of this circuit, or actually, let's find the the angular frequency and then the frequency in hertz. Uh, when we talk about angular frequency, or at least I really, really try to, I use. This is angular frequency. And that means that the, that's the frequency that's, that is, I'm sorry, that is the uh, omega that's in the sine function of an oscillator. So I call it angular frequency. It has the same units as an angular velocity, okay? But there's a reason why we don't call, uh, I don't call this angular velocity. Sim because it's not doing this, okay? It's not like you're sitting your LC circuit down to start spinning around, okay? That would be, ang I mean, yeah, would be cool. that would be angular velocity when the thing is starting spinning around like this, okay? Angular frequency is just the nature of it is kind of like something going back and forth or moving around in a circle because you're using sines and cosines. So the, the angular frequency is one over the square root of L times C. Now here you have to just, you have to do this and don't, you have to convert all your megas and micros and whatever it is you get here, okay? So it's one over 
the square root of 3 times 10 to the negative 6, 4 times 10 to the negative, oh, I'm sorry, 4.5 times 10 to the negative 3. So if somebody would do that, tell me what you get for the angular frequency here. Eighty-six oh six, or eighty-six oh seven, I guess. Yeah. Units of that, by the way. Radians per second. So this is radians per second. And if I wanted to find the frequency, I take this number divided by two pi. Please divide that by 2 pi and tell me what you get. You divide that by 2 pi. You divide this by 2 pi. Yeah, all of these things are related. All of these things are related because there's two pi radians in a cycle. So you get cycles per second divided by two pi. Well, that would be maybe good. Round. It's okay. 1370 is good. 1370. Units of that. Hertz. Hertz. Maximum current in this circuit. Look at the maximum current. If I were to find it. Well, because the problem is after a long time, it's just going to keep going back and yeah. forth. So, how long do you wait? When you ask? Is, is in the deep of the maximum current. There's another way to do it. Let's take a look at this thing, right? How do I find current? Derivative. Take a derivative of that. So if we take a derivative of this, we can find out what the current is as a function of time. Okay? So the current as a function of time is equal to Q to T. So let's take a look at it, okay? So Q naught, okay, it's Q naught. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Okay? So negative q naught sine of omega t. And then what do you do? Take a derivative of this, which gives you omega, a factor of omega. What's the maximum of this function going to be? Oh, Q naught omega. Now, those of you who are staring, why? Because sine only goes to one. Sine goes from negative one to one. So the maximum of this is going to be whenever this is one or negative one. In this case, it would be negative one if you're worried about the direction. And so that Q naught there, so Q naught omega is going to be your maximum current. That's your max current right there. Okay? Omega. Q naught is uh, 336 times 10 to the negative 6. 
Uh, that's uh, 36 microcoulombs right here. Oh, oh. Okay. The omega is Why did we get the Q naught omega? Because if I look at this function right here, its maximum of value occurs when that is one. Point three zero nine eight. I don't trust that because three oh nine eight. Units of that, Coulomb radians per second. Amps. Remember that a radiant is just one of those useless things that we just put in to remind us that we are talking about some angle. When we're talking about curve, we're no longer talking about angle, we just put in. way it goes. The negative sign indicates is that this voltage has a sense this way, current is going to be increasing this way, so therefore it's a negative current. Because it's actually DIDT. DIDT is going to be in the negative sense of what this charge is. All right. Um, we could put all three together here, and we would have a LRC circuit. And so, what would that kind of look like? Um, or really, what would be happening here? I'm not going to really worry about the specific equations we get out of this, but rather I will describe it to you in terms of what it is. Uh, once again, with a circuit like this, if I don't have a driving battery or anything, I want to start out with the capacitance, with the charge on the capacitance. Reasons because I can't put a current in here and before I throw the switch and any current in there would be strangely would be stopped very very quickly. Uh, what would this be? Well, without the resistance in here, right? Without the resistance in here, it's what we call a a simple harmonic oscillator. That's the LC. That's just the LC. Okay, so it's just the LC. What do you think the resistor would do with that? Resistor would do with it. Dissipate. It would start dissipating the energy from the L and the C. And so it's like including friction with your spring. Uh, it's like including uh, the friction with the pendulum. That's why pendulums don't go on forever, why springs don't go on forever, because they're not just <coughs> simple harmonic oscillations that go on forever. This one has resistance in here, would do something that we call, call it a damped. Oscillator. Okay. So in other words, there would be damping with this. So when you go on in engineering, you'll learn about the different kinds of damping that you can have. 
okay? You can have what's called an underdamped, underdamped, overdamped, and what's the other one? Huh? Goldilocks. Critically damped. That's a term I learned. But could be Goldilocks. Let's see. What is it? Let's see if I can remember what it means. I'd have to look at it. But if it's an underdamped, what's going to happen is this. Uh, you'll get some oscillations, like so, and they dampen out over time. That's an underdamped one. Underdamped. Okay? Yes, you will. Okay? You need to know this. It would benefit you greatly to write this down now while I'm giving it to you in a cursory form like this, then the way when not only do you have to get this, but you have to get all the equations to go with it too. Huh? Oh, yeah, see? There you go. Now the overdamp. See, this is what this is what uh, I was always confused by. Something was overdamped. If you have too much resistance in this thing, put too much resistance compared to the oscillation with your uh, inductor and capacitor, then you have what's called an overdamped. And an overdamped goes to zero. doesn't oscillate, goes to zero. Critically damped, just the right amount of resistance. Right amount. We'll go to zero. These are both exponential decays, but the critically damped is actually quicker than the overdamped. Yes, yes, yes. I. Underdamped would start one off. Yes. Sorry. I just can't throw. Yes, but underdamped would start one off. Okay? Yes. Would the overdamped only be half phase or would it be rectified? It would only be it would only be half phase. In other words, both of these things go to the zero once. Goes to equilibrium, that's it. Now the reason why, and because I always wondered about this when I first took this, I'm like well, wait a minute. If you put more resistance, right? If you put more resistance in this thing, wouldn't it get the zero quicker? Okay? But the problem is you could put too much resistance. Think of taking a spring, right? Now, spring in air is underdamped, right? If I put it in, say, water, then it goes to zero and stops. Let's say that that is my critical damping, putting it in water. Now let's put it in molasses. Yes, it's going to go to zero and stop, but it's going to take a while to get through all the molasses to get there. So if you put more resistance in this thing, you end up over damping it, and it ends up taking longer for it to dissipate, simply because that resistance is going to keep blocking the current, so the current can't flow, charge can't, can't, get, can't get those charges off that capacitor. So there's a special critical damped here when it just, just right goes to gets to zero fastest. So in other words, this is resistance is low, low resistance, and this is uh, too much resistance, and this would be just right. Just right. What do you mean that it's half? The over, the over and the critically are both just go to zero once. They do not oscillate. It just goes back to the equilibrium and stops. It doesn't get to the other side. The other one, underdamped, would go this way. So in other words, when you first start out, if you have no resistance, of course, it's just going to do this all day. Okay? Start adding resistance. Okay? You get less and less of these bounces. Okay? Less bounces before it can dissipate. Finally, when you get to the, okay, then when you get to the critical, it doesn't even get to bounce. 
Okay? But if you slow it down too much, then it's going to take, it's going to get the zero just once, but it's going to take a while to get there because you've slowed it down too much. Could you have a scenario where it doesn't reach zero? There's so much resistance there. Well, theoretically, none of them reach zero because they're exponentials. So what happens, so what happens is, is that once you get to this point, the sine part of the function actually goes away and you get exponential here. And then for critically gaps, is that the amount of damping that would prevent it from ever reaching a negative value? Is that kind of the implication? Yeah, that would be very, that would, right, it would never, it would just go back to zero, that's it. Okay. Yes, that's the first one you get that way. And then after that, it just takes longer to get there. I'll take those things out for you, because if I had my book with me, I'd look it up. I'm sure you'll put acid in there. I just forgot, and I don't want to write down a differential equation and derive it. Not that one. All right, so that's as far as we, we've done everything we can with the DC circuits and everything we can. So We'll actually start the next chapter today because we've got a little bit of time. I know, I know, I know. But this way I'll have more time to go over because there's lots to go over in this one chapter on circuits. And that's what happens if we start burying the current. We want to start burying the current. Because our generator, our AC generator, where you have the triangle or the whatever it is you're spinning around in the magnetic field is going to generate electricity. Okay? That electricity is going to be generated with a particular omega, which will actually correspond to the how fast this thing is rotating. So what happens when we start generating, generating a voltage or an EMF with a change in time? So in other words, the voltage that we're going to have here that's going to be on our circuit is going to be some maximum value, maximum value. This is, I uh, forgot what number. What chapter were we on? 31, 30. Yeah, so this is uh, going on, this is 31, right, this is 31. <coughs> Multiply by, and cosine, I'll go ahead and say, I'll just say sine. We can have the omega t be anything we want at this point. <clears throat> Which then would mean that, um, so this is going to be our generator, and uh, we're going to generate some of this, and I, would, I could actually have any kind of phase in here. I just put sine to, to kind of be doing it. So really I would say uh, plus V or minus V. We'll get over that in a minute, okay, what we actually do. In this case, we would put this particular here. And we want to kind of figure out what happens when we put this variable EMF here, this oscillatory EMF. Now for this, we need to know two things. We need to know a, well, we talk about a maximum value here. And then, of course, we need the frequency. So that's, that's the kind of thing when we write down this equation. And then we would put it across different circuit elements. Wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Um, how much voltage is that outlet? 110. Is that an AC? Yes. Yeah. AC 110. Yeah, so 60 hertz. Where do you get the 110? I mean, think about it. This voltage that's actually coming out of the wires in the wall does this. Okay. So if I think this is a function of time, right? That's an E. 
<laughs> it looks like this. Okay, sines and cosines are going to do this. All right? That's E max. If I look at this, I'm like, what? It only touches E max once and negative E max once every cycle. That's it. If I want to typify the voltage coming out of that thing, I definitely would not be picking E max. Because only at one instant in each cycle is it E max, and at another instant it's negative E max. So if I want a number to typify the voltage coming out of that thing, hmm, let's see, what do I use? Um, Divided by square root of 2. It's an average. There's a slight problem with looking at an average here. What's the average of that? Zero. 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 Oops. I can't do that. I can't do that. So what we do is we come up with another way It's sort of an average, but not an average. We do some things with it because we don't want it to be some zero because that just make, doesn't make any sense either. How much voltage you got? Oh, zero. Why are the lights on? <laughs> I got zero voltage in the lights. Oh, look at that. Wow, cool. I've solved the energy problem. I have zero voltage and the lights are working. What we end up doing is we end up taking a power equivalent to a DC circuit. In other words, what we do is we ask ourselves, we ask ourselves, if I were to replace that outlet with a giant DC battery, what voltage would I need to have the same power output as I get with that thing in AC? That thing in AC. And remember, power depends on not the voltage, but the square of the voltage. So what I do is I take that voltage and I square it. So I take the voltage squared. Which will look like this. Then I take the average of that. Of the V squared plot. Which just so happens because it's sinusoidal that the average, the average of the V square is equal to V square over two. That's the average of my V square plot. But I don't want the average of the V square because that's voltage square. I need to do, oh, I need to get a, a, a regular old voltage out of it. So well, what do I want to do with this? And take the take the square root of this. So I take the square root of this to come up with the voltage that I'm going to use to typify my output here. And by the way, this is the max, right? V max. And so this is V max divided by square root of two. Or you can say my Emacs divided by square root of 2, whatever it is. Now, what do we call this voltage? Well, uh, what did I do to go from here to here? What I do? I square it. Whoops. There we go. Square. Okay? What's another name for average? Mean. Mean. root mean squared, and that's your RMS value. That's the value we use to typify your to, to, to typify an AC outlet. Because if I took a gigantic 110 volt battery, regular old battery, I get the same output as I do from that outlet. I get the same power output through that outlet. So this is what we call the RMS. Okay. I was wondering in the last one that 
Guess what the RMS means? Root mean squared. Okay? And so it's these numbers that we're going to use to start typifying our voltages when we're dealing with an AC circuit. If you put your voltmeter on AC to measure AC voltage, it's the RMS value you're getting. It's the RMS value you're getting. because it's the useful one. It's kind of what, what I would call a DC equivalent. The DC battery, 110 volts. That's as far as we're gonna go for the AC today. I just wanted to introduce this so that we can start from there on Monday. We start going through what we do with our circuit elements in the AC circuit.